As of right now, America's slogan isn't life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but arm the world because we win! Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to remind you guys that if you would like to financially support this show, you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. You can check out the rewards, the tiers, and the golds that you would be supporting. We have no corporate sponsors, so we are powered by the people. So we are people-sponsored. So go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha and check out how, what you can do to help support the show. Now let's get into this week's episode. We recently had the third Democratic debate, or as I like to call it, democracy for commercials. The Democratic debates have basically become like political Baskin Robbins. There are 31 flavors, and about 26 of them are basically the same flavor with a different kind of poisonous food coloring. As for the rest, well, one of them is trying to warn us about how ice cream is going to go obsolete because of self serving sherbet machines. Uh, I think one of them is trying to be your favorite. One of them is melting in front of our eyes and is trying very desperately to convince us that it's not. And there are two flavors that we the people actually want. And in the most recent debates, one of these flavors was not on stage. I am, of course, talking about Tulsi Gabbard. And for everyone wondering what flavor she is, you're probably not listening to Tulsi's message. Tulsi Gabbard can't be put into one carton. She's a complex human with a tapestry of thoughts, ideas, and emotions. She's not just one of our favorite flavors. She's all of them. And this is, this is one of the challenges that people in Washington have had with me from the very beginning, is I don't fit cleanly in any one of those categories or those labels, and they're scratching their head like, well, we can't figure her out. Right. Which is incredible, because That's how most it's of very us are. simple. <laughs> it's how most of us are. We yeah. look at things, look at issues, like, does this make sense or does it not make sense? But for me, it's, it's uh, I'm motivated not by an interest to serve my party or to get somewhere politically, but... I really actually want to serve my country. I really want to serve the people of this country. I'm going to do my best to do that. And that's how, that's the lens through which I view these different issues. Presidential candidate and representative Tulsi Gabbard was not on the debate stage because she didn't get onto enough DNC approved polls, which is basically the same thing as saying someone can't get their tumors treated because it wasn't a Philip Morris approved lung cancer. Basically, Representative Gabbard met every unique supporter requirement with ease, and when she arrived on the second debate stage, she tore down DNC darling Kamala Harris by using Kamala Harris. Just, just by the virtue of Kamala being Kamala. Tulsi pointed out Kamala's horrific criminal justice record, which, as it turns out, was all criminal and, and no justice at all. There was, like, no justice. Then, as Kamala Harris just ruffled through her papers to look for a comeback, I could see the words Russia and potent puppet form over her head. Okay, they had nothing. So they went with a smear campaign of Tulsi being an Assad apologist. A narrative that time and time again, has been proven to be false. Tulsi Gabbard, who is a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, met with Assad to see if there was a diplomatic and peaceful resolution that would not only be a benefit to the people of Syria, but also the active military personnel fighting another war we shouldn't be. As of right now, America's slogan isn't life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but arm the world because we win! On the Useful Idiots podcast, Tulsi pointed out that she'd rather be an advocate for peace than a war hawk. 
you know, Democrats used to, on some level at least, be a little bit less hawkish. Um, and, you know, one of the things that liberals liked about Obama was that he said he would talk to North Korea. Exactly. And all of a sudden we see... And Castro. And Castro, and, right, right. That was a plus, right? Diplomacy. We believed yeah. in diplomacy as opposed to um, strike first. Un ask understanding questions. that the only alternative to diplomacy is war. Right, exactly. That's why it's important. And nowadays you see liberals, the only thing they like about Trump or the only thing they want him to do is ratchet things up. They're yeah. constantly calling on him to do that with Putin, with Syria. Um, which, of course, I don't know what they think the end game is. That's the problem, is they're not thinking of the end game. Right. The question we should be asking is, why are there so many liberals ready to go to war? I mean, wasn't peace the liberal thing to do? But the only time we call Trump presidential is when he's ready to turn a country into a parking lot with the big dick of the American military. I mean, okay, look, his rhetoric... And, and what he says about women and brown people is abhorrent. But dropping those bombs on those brown people, I mean, that's presidential right there, okay? That's that's what presidents do, is is they, they murder innocent people. I mean, that's why we elected people. Now, look, if you're a loyal Trump supporter, his militaristic approach to the Middle East and the media fawning over his presidential role via warmongering should piss you off. Could Trump ran on a non-interventionist foreign policy plan. He said he was going to put America first, but it seems like now that's a secondary plan to fucking over seven countries to line the pockets of the fossil fuel and war industries. Recently, he tweeted out that, that, that the American military is locked and loaded and he's waiting for the Saudis to tell him how to use the American military and enact a regime change war in Iran. Tulsi call him out for being Saudi Arabia's bitch. I'm waiting for the corporate media to completely miss the point and go off and lose their shit about how she used that naughty word. How dare she uses the B word instead of propping up the W word. War! We need war! I mean, can we really expect any more from the propaganda wing of the American war economy? Even when it comes to drone warfare, she's got a pretty measured response to the large responsibility we have to use this technology as weapons. There are many different tools and weapons that our military has that should only be used, uh, that should only be used to, to defeat an enemy and to defeat a threat that threatens our safety and our security. I think that some folks out there would object to using drones at all. Just, uh, for example, Medea Benjamin uh, wrote about a killing by remote control, saying that you know, it kind of, uh, it doesn't really convey you know the, the full impact of of the lives that that these drone pilots are taking, you know, when when they're using them. Um, do you think that that's a, a legitimate concern? I think it is a concern, but it is not dissimilar to um, the same concern that we have with with pilots who are flying in planes and, and the same impact that are had, that, that's had when, uh, when bombs are dropped. Um, so I, I think this is, um, this is a bigger issue for us to look at, that whether it is an unmanned plane or if it is a manned plane, the impact and the result uh, is the same. So we have to be very careful with very clear objectives on how and when and where these weapons are used. Now, I'm against using this technology for warring purposes because it's pretty clear that we don't know how to use it. But I still understand Tulsi's point of view, even though this is an issue I disagree with her on. Look, drone warfare under Obama increased killing Americans, and drone warfare under Bezos would kill even more Americans by shooting consumerism through every household window. But weaving a false narrative is all they have against Tulsi Gabbard. The Harris camp didn't even come out to make a statement that they had changed their views on criminal justice reform, but rather just kept deflecting it. Right? Look, Kamala Harris stands for the prison industrial complex. Also, clearly, she has a, a hawkish way of contributing to the American war economy with these smears. 
Since Kamala Harris didn't really talk about criminal justice reform, but rather criminal injustice, let's look at how Tulsi Gabbard squares up against her. Tulsi worked with represent Republican Representative Tom Garrett to introduce House Bill 1227, which would federally decriminalize marijuana. Look, because of the confusion of state-by-state -state decriminalization in marijuana creates, Representative Gabbard believes that one of, it would highly benefit the American economy if marijuana was just federally decriminalized. In her state of Hawaii alone, banks are encouraged to decline loans to any businesses associated with marijuana sales. And this is killing entrepreneurship and chill vibes. For example, the contradiction that we see currently between state and federal laws on marijuana has created a serious problem for many of our local businesses. I've talked with local bankers in my home state of Hawaii who express great frustration and even confusion about the contradiction between our laws. The fact that our state of Hawaii has legalized and authorized marijuana dispensaries to grow, process, and dispense medical marijuana. Federal law also prohibits banks and credit unions from offering any type of financial services to both businesses and individuals whose financial transactions have anything to do with marijuana. So what this means in a practical term is that our state-recognized and licensed medical marijuana dispensary owners, as well as their employees, they can't open a bank account. They can't get a loan from our local bank. The businesses literally have to hold thousands or even millions of dollars of their transactions and conducting their transactions in cash. Businesses that provide services to these medical marijuana dispensaries are also unable to access financial services due to the gaps between federal and state law. She's against the class classification of marijuana as a Schedule One drug. The outrageousness of this comes from the fact that not a single human or animal has been killed by the use of marijuana. Dr. Donald Abrams, who's the chief of oncology at San Francisco General Hospital, has talked about how in the 37 years that he has worked and served as a physician, the number of patients that he's admitted to his hospital with marijuana complications are zero. Physicians have stated that there have been no complications with marijuana use, but we're losing about 130 people a day to the opioid epidemic. But marijuana continues to be classified as a lethal drug and Oxycontin is prescribed by doctors by the pound. And, and, and that is just unacceptable, okay? I mean, doctors should really know that they should use the metric system, okay? If it's good enough for drug dealers, then it should be good enough for the MDs. As of right now, there is only one pharmaceutical CEO that has been arrested for being responsible for the opioid crisis. Lawrence O'Dowd III of the Rochester Drug Cooperative was arrested over the summer. RDC purchases opioid from manufacturers and distributes them to pharmacies across the country. They're basically like the Postmates for narcotics. They're the corporate equivalent of the guy behind the high school wearing a trench coat that can sell you that good, good shit. Now look, I highly doubt that O'Dowd is gonna go to some maximum security prison, right? It's not like he, he's a, a, a journalist that published US war crimes. He's just a, a, a CEO, you know, that flooded the market with a highly addictive substance and made them as available as M&Ms at your local Walgreens. But legalization would prove unequivocally that the products peddled by Big Pharma are not as good as the natural medicine that the planet makes. With this legislation, in tandem with the glory of the free market, we can prove that once and for all, making these companies that have suckled at the teats of exploitation go bankrupt. Now, this bill will also reduce rates of recidivism. If you're unsure about what recidivism is, it's basically creating a rehabilitation system that is so bad 
that ex-cons repeat the same behaviors and return to prison. It's like a, a, a recycling program for prisons. You know, it's the pretty much the only thing America is actually excited about recycling. This is like the green old deal, you know, like, and it's not even like a nice green. It's, it's like a, it's like a, like a, like a bad poop green. Attack on Tulsi's campaign come at a constant barrage, right? People still claim that she's homophobic despite two apologies and her legislative records to fight for LGBTQ rights. They have also attacked her for having connection to the Indian populist prime minister, Narendra Modi. There are uh, things that hap are happening within the Indian government um, that, that I disagree with. I don't pretend to, to support or approve of or endorse all the practices of, of the ruling party uh, in India. Uh, I, as we look at different governments around the world, again, I think my approach is looking at serving what is in the best interest of the American people, being willing to sit with others, whether they be friends or adversaries or potential adversaries, always keeping at the forefront who I work for and who I serve. Right. So now, I think Modi is a complex character, and I've addressed that in a prior podcast and video, but she's also been very critical of the religious violence that has been a long-standing problem in India. I don't, I don't dispute that these things are occurring, and I've been very consistent over the years in calling out uh, this kind of religious uh, persecution and bigotry based on religion wherever it may take place. I think that's important for all of us uh, to do, whether it's happening here in the United States or it's happening in other parts of the world. And Tulsi points out that she met with Modi to have constructive relations with India. This is what good relationships are supposed to be. Constructive. Look, she has called out religious persecution and doesn't agree with everything with the ruling party of India. And the BJP has made some very terrible mistakes, amongst them saying nothing about the cow vigilantes attacking Muslims. That's right. India has cow vigilantes, a bovine Justice League, if you will, who kind of act like the Legion of Doom. Well, for, for Muslims, anyway. And yet, yet, we see McDonald's and Burger Kings opening up new franchises in that country every day. Okay, these vigilantes seem a little misdirected in their crusade. Th this, is, this is just one of the negative attributes about the ruling party in India. Tulsi was also chastised for not voting for American intervention of Muslim violence in India back in 2002. Now, this does make sense because one of Tulsi's core principles is against American interventionism. And look, America should not be dictating the laws of another country, but you can make friendly suggestions, right? As of now, American interventionism, trying to control the laws of another country, is basically legislative rape. And Tulsi Gabbard is the only anti-interventionist candidate running right now, or at least one of the most vocal anti-interventionists and anti-militaristic candidates running right now. She's the only one standing up against the military industrial complex and pushing back against America's regime change wars. But there's no question about it that the leadership of the Democratic Party is not supporting Bernie Sanders and also Tulsi Gabbard because both of them represent uh, a negative with respect to the military industrial complex. Uh, and Tulsi knows firsthand what the true cost of these wars is because she's currently a major in the Army National Guard. She served in the Iraq war and she's seen the tragic theater of combat. In fact, one of the reasons why the DNC was able to cheat her out of the third debates is because she stopped campaigning and went to Indonesia to serve. She decided to serve after 9-11 and in 2004 got to Iraq and once she was there she realized that the war was a lie sold to the American people and the soldiers under the guise of national security and humanitarianism. Like so many people we were there uh, to serve our country and, and believing the lie that we were all told that hey 
we've got to go to Iraq and topple Saddam Hussein, this brutal dictator, because he's working with Al Qaeda and they've got weapons of mass destruction and they're going to use them to attack us. I mean, that's the mission and the mindset that we went there uh, believing. Mm-hmm. Like, again, like so many politicians in Washington, so many people in the country, right. uh, only to really realize that we were, we were lied to. Uh, and that we were betrayed. This really wasn't about going after Al Qaeda. This wasn't about fulfilling that mission of protecting the American people at all. It was a regime change war that was launched under the guise of of national security, under the guise of humanitarianism. You know, nobody likes a sequel, especially when the original sucked real hard. Okay, I mean, the original had the lie of dead babies. Look, no one really likes dead baby jokes, okay? And when there are dead baby lies that led us into a regime change war for oil, that's that's just bad form. You know, you just can't trust the guy that threw out the dead baby lies for 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 a war for oil. You just you just can't trust it anymore. Tulsi's push for financial responsibility came from speaking to the third party nationals that worked for Halliburton, which had taken the opportunity to brand themselves throughout the war. I mean, what war couldn't use a logo, right? I mean, Halliburton for Iraq 1 and 2, Nixon's face for Vietnam, and racism for the Civil War. But these third-party nationals that were employed by Halliburton were only getting paid $500 a month. And seeing plastered all over our Mm. camp big emblem of KBR Halliburton, oh God, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You saw it, I'm mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> yeah, every outhouse was, yeah, exactly. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we're from Hawaii. We have, like, very diverse, you know, we have people from across the Pacific, Filipino, Chinese, Vietnamese, all kinds of people in our unit. And we started making friends with the, mm-hmm. the what were called the third country nationals that mm-hmm. were hired by KBR Halliburton to come and do things like clean the outhouses or cook the meals in the chow hall. And uh, so we'd start to make friends with them and talk with them and you know, go outside behind the tent, start cooking rice and sharing food and uh, just start asking, hey, how much are you guys making? You know, How are you being treated? Oh, it was outrageous, it right? It was outrageous yeah, yeah. to see. I mean, hearing, oh, I get paid $500 a month. Wow. A month to work 12 hour days, six, seven days a week. How often do you get home to see your family? Maybe once a year, but probably every other year. Mm-hmm. And just knowing the billions, the billions of dollars these companies are making, and really to have this indentured servitude, it just it went to, well, this is the military industrial complex right. that they're really the ones who are profiting. Right. Tulsi's push for Medicare for all, holding Wall Street accountable and reinstating Glass-Steagall comes from seeing these indentured servants of war profiteers and their reflection on the American people. I mean, Americans today are working two to three jobs. People are drowning in loans and debts and caught in the web of poverty. Meanwhile, Bush Jr. keeps making fucking watercolor paintings and macaroni art and everybody fawns over it and gives him fucking galleries. Dick Cheney is amassing more human hearts and John Bolton keeps twirling his mustache as if that is going to start the war in Iran. And all of these people are becoming richer than God themselves. Which, by the way, is like, that's not like an empty statement I'm making. Jesus was basically a beardy homeless guy hanging out with lepers and prostitutes. Krishna was a cow herder. Okay, Moses basically led a union protest and a strike that led a whole group of people into the desert. Then all of these stewards and versions of God seem to take the form of the working class and not a CEO. I mean, okay, sure, Rama was a king. But he gets exiled and has to go live in the woods, like in a shack, like a one-bedroom shack. Okay, so some of these rich politicians that invoke the name of God to get richer, richer or, or wage wars are really doing the work of, well, themselves and their addiction to greed. I know I just uh, brought up Glass-Steagall, and I'm sure there are some people that probably don't know what that is. Uh, This was a piece of legislation that was passed in 1933 that was meant to separate commercial and investment banking and uh, restore confidence 
the American banking system. And in 1999, it was repealed just in time for Y2K to fuck all of us. And Y2K is my very cute nickname for Wall Street because they basically did what everybody was afraid the real Y2K was going to do and fuck all of us into the 1930s. But with Twitter this time, that way that way we get to like tweet about our poverty, you know? That's that's like a fun exciting thing that they gave us to do. It's just um this is a uh, this is my bread and water lunch today, you know? That's but it's like fun. It's like poverty became fun, you know, because because they still allowed us to have Twitter and and share our misery with each other. But the notion of how are we going to pay for it has been branded as a conservative issue. Which is a bizarre. reporter asked me this question literally just yesterday uh, after the New Hampshire Democratic Convention. Uh, she said, well, you know, you, she's talking about how I've made it a central focus of my campaign that we need to end these wasteful counterproductive wars, uh, work to end this new Cold War and arms race and redirect our taxpayer dollars that we've wasted for so long to the tune of six trillion dollars since 9-11 alone, redirect those resources back here to serve the needs of our people, to take care of uh, the urgent concerns people have, whether it's health care, infrastructure, uh, education. Uh, and, and her point was, well, this sounds like a conservative message. I said, what are you talking about? Right. She said, well, you know, the conservative message of how do you pay for things? I said, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, Americans across this country are sick and tired of hearing from politicians and from their government that there's not enough money to make sure that kids in Flint, kids in Newark, kids in communities across this country can't have clean water to drink because the government can't make sure that that infrastructure ensures clean water. No. You know, they're sick and tired of hearing that, you know, levees are failing and there's massive flooding in rural Iowa that's ruining uh, farms for their entire year of crops. And they're told, well, you know what, sorry, there's just not enough money to make sure that this infrastructure is holding to keep you and your family safe. So this is not a conservative concern. This is an American concern. And it's a logical one. I mean, one of the questions we never want to actually ask is how are we going to pay to wage these wars or or give more tax breaks to, to greedy corporations? How are we going to continue to afford Jake Tapper's fucking salary? How are we going to pay for these endless lies? Oh, that's right. By revoking the rights of the American people. The question of payment of these plans starts by significantly reducing the astronomical military budget and making Jeff Bezos pay his taxes for like minimum one year. Just try it out, Jeffy! Tulsi also takes the title of public servant very seriously. In many instances, she talks about being in service to the American people and what benefits them, not a corporate or special interest. It's what made her want to run for office at age 21. Uh, you know, at, at a deeper level, even as a young person, as, as you know, a teenager, as a kid, I experienced um, that I was happiest when I was doing things for other people. And so knew in some form or another that I wanted to pursue a path of service in my life. Didn't know exactly how or in what form that would take, but uh, ultimately made that decision at 21 to run for the state house, really seeing the opportunity to have a much bigger impact on things. That's right. At 21, she was running to be the representative of her state of Hawaii. At age 21, I was figuring out what bathtub was my favorite to drunkenly cry in. Uh, and if just anybody's wondering, uh, it was not my bathtub. It was uh, not mine. When she was running, her first issue was connected with a landfill that was going to be built over an aquifer and educating people on why that would be bad for the drinking water and the planet itself. Like protecting our clean water sources, our water aquifers, our oceans, uh, and our environment. Uh, something I had been involved with even as a teenager, forming a nonprofit, you know, joining with my friends to go clean up beaches, but seeing, gosh, 
what better way to make an impact than to be a, a policymaker mm -hmm. to make sure that, um, you know, as a government, we are making that a priority. Right. When so. uh, there was a landfill that was projected to be built directly over one of our largest water aquifers in the state. Okay. The most populated island in the state is the island of Oahu, where I live and where I grew up. And what I saw through this process as we were going around gathering signatures, uh, getting people aware of the danger of building a landfill over a water aquifer was how close the uh, landfill developer was with the politicians who were greasing the wheels to get this project approved without really being the consumer protectors that they're supposed to be. Right. And she goes on to say that the belief that we're custodians of the planet gives a lot of insight into her environmentalism. It's, 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 um, it's a way of life. Right. You know, growing up in Hawaii, the culture that we're surrounded by is one where we are taught to be custodians of our home, of Mother Earth, uh, and to respect and to take care of uh, our planet, to take care of our home. She's quoted to say, whether we like it or not, our fates as human beings in this world are tied together. And the issues we face, pollution of our air, our waters, oceans, the climate crisis that's before us, these are all issues that require us to sit down, to talk, to work together. Whether it be with friends or people who are our adversaries or potential adversaries. If we in the United States do all we can right now to address climate change, it will still not be enough. We cannot solve these problems alone. We have to work together. We have to work together to make sure our kids today and for generations to come can not only survive, but also thrive and prosper without the fear of toxic and poisonous water or polluted air or not enough food to eat. Climate change should be a bipartisan issue. I mean, we've seen an increase in extreme weather patterns, a variety of species going extinct, forest fires of all kinds spreading faster due to longer dry season. And at one point it got so hot in India that tires were melting into the roads. Like she said, our fates are interlinked with the world we share, regardless of our identities. We've bought into the cult of oil and fossil fuels, but we don't have to keep drinking their Kool-Aid. Gabbard's service to ensure people's right to clean air, water, and food is reflected in her anti-fracking stance and by voting against revoking the Clean Air Act. It should be astounding that humanity needed to make a law to not ruin the thing we breathe to live. I, I don't I don't have an al analogy for this because it's just too fucking insane. And, and, then, and then we wanted to revoke that law. Representative Gabbard also went to Standing Rock to protest the pipeline and stand for water rights. And because of this passionate service to the people and everything she stands for, the DNC ensured that she was not to be seen on that debate stage by cheating her out of it. Uh, and I know that Tulsi Gabbard is going to try and stay in for the October debates. Uh, she, was, she was cheated out of the process just the way they cheated me. When we got the, uh, and she has, got the same, the proper number of donors uh, uh, over uh, over 1,200. Uh, but what happened to her and happened to me is that they didn't put my name. They made sure my name did not appear in a number of polls. But there's a lot of controversy, a lot of controversy about the whole DNC process. I'm just going to... Her name wasn't even included in some of the polls. I mean, at this point, the polls might as well have been conducted by, you know, the, the videos of animals that 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 sound like they're saying human words. You know, did, 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 did you hear that bark? It sounded like the dog was saying Biden. No, it sounds like the dog was barking to f say, feed me. That's what it sounds. Stop starving your dog and force feeding the American people someone they don't want. 
The DNC's process lacks transparency and is extremely complex, so people that want to participate in it feel lost about the process. The sheer notion that Tulsi Gabbard is running for president has exposed how corrupt the DNC and the lengths they will go to keep a truly viable candidate out of the race. Furthermore, her support of Bernie Sanders in 2016 and dropping a prominent position in the DNC probably didn't help her curry the favors of the, uh, 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 of the DNC either. And after the first two debates, Tulsi, just after the short fraction of airtime that she got, she became the most Googled candidate after both debates. After which Google said, wait, 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 wait. Uh, a, a candidate that actually stands for people. I mean, we did not approve of that. And clearly, since we've given up on be not being evil, we're going to make sure that nobody hears her messages. <laughs> and then they blocked all her ads. Can, can the cow vigilantes go after Google instead of the Muslims in India? After these blocks happened, she tried to get a statement from Google, but they treated her like she was a crazy ex and ignored all of her calls. Tulsi is now suing Google for manipulating elections, and she states that Google has too much power and apparently are colluding with the DNC, and we don't need the FBI involved to see how blatant that is. The kind of power that Google has is this huge tech monopoly to interfere in our public discourse, interfere in what people are seeing when they're going and looking, uh, using their search engine, and really how they can impact our fair elections. Yeah. And some people have come out and said, well, why is she even running when she's not on the debate stage? Because to her, it's not about the advertisement of democracy. It's about serving the people and fighting for equality and justice. And she's on the ground doing town halls, hearing what the real issues that Americans face every day are. And, and meanwhile, the rest of the Baskin Robin flavors melt under the hot lights of corporate media for sound bites and gotcha moments. And look, if you're going to be questioning her run for the Oval Office, then you should be questioning why Biden, Harris, Buttigieg, or a variety of the corporate whores are still running when people have dictated that they are wildly unpopular and their records show that they are unviable. That's the only time when prostitution is considered legal in America, is when politicians do it for corporations. Look, Tulsi is proving to be the candidate that a lot of Americans do want. And that scares the corporate states of America. That's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and please give it a share. Share it with your friends, share it with your enemies, share it with anybody you think would enjoy or benefit from a video like this. Uh, videos like this are usually suppressed. They are not shown to a whole lot of people because the content is not corporate safe. It's not friendly to the corporations. So they, so it usually gets suppressed. Uh, so uh, a great way to help a show like this, an independent DIY show, uh, that covers socially conscious issues is by sharing it out to as many people as you can uh, share it out to. And if you would like to continue supporting the show financially, help it grow, help it get better, uh, you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha, where you can see all the tiers, the goals, the rewards that you can get, and it all starts at only 2 dollars a month that's the cost of like one cup of coffee that's all you'd have to give up a month is one cup of coffee and i'm not even telling you don't drink a cup of coffee a day to support this show i'm saying maybe like maybe invest in like a a, a french press or, or or maybe in like a tiny espresso machine and and feel and then that way you feel good about the coffee you're drinking and about supporting socially conscious independent DIY comedy content. So go over to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha and consider donating today. 
I've got live stand-up comedy shows coming up. I'm going to be in Blacksburg, Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, I'm going to be doing the Cat's Den at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Virginia. I'm coming back to Kalamazoo, Michigan, Lansing, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. I'm touring all over the country, you guys. I'm, I'm going to be everywhere. Uh, so uh, if you enjoy intelligent, socially conscious stand-up comedy that addresses uh, a variety of issues, uh, then come see me live. Go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Grab your tickets. Come hang out with me. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it, it's always fun to see people that enjoy the show. Thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again for supporting. To all the patrons that have already become patrons, thank you guys so much. Every single little bit helps this show. Every single little bit helps you uh, helps me create more content like this, get more uh, videos up. And uh, uh, till next week, we'll see you on the road.